Hi everybody, my name is Karen Brown and I'm with the Woodland Woodcarvers and tonight we're going to be talking about putting, show you how to put scales on the fish. This is the back side that we're going to show you how to do this. We've gone ahead and carved the little X's in and then we burned the scales onto the fish and we'll be showing you how to do all of that tonight. So we're going to start with our plain naked fish. So he's got him carved down. We've got him sanded smooth. And I've decided, then I put my one first line on the fish to go for the scales. And as you can see, I've got it already marked down in intervals for the size of the wood burning pan that I'm working with. I've got two sizes. I've got a small one for around the head and the belly. And I've got a larger scale that we're going to be doing on the body. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take my plastic flexible ruler here and we're going to go through and we're going to start marking off all of these marks to go on here. So we're going to mark all these off so we can get our diagonals in. Okay. And I like the flexible rulers because I can get it to bend around the object that I'm working on. I'm just going to draw these as reference lines and then we're going to flip it around and go back the other way to get our diagonals now. You don't have to draw the pencil lines real dark because we're going to go over these with a white stone. It's the, harder, uh, st the hardest of the stones that I had in my book. Um, I don't need to make a deep rut in here to do this next step. We just want to make sure that it is in there enough to give surface texture to each one of the scales. Okay, we've got our scales on now. And we're going to take this, this is the white stone ball that I have on here. We're going to use this to indent just slightly into the wood, just enough to make these X's in here to show this area off. We're going to use this on high speed. I'm almost just erasing the lines with that little ball. Now I've gone one way now that this is the trick is to come back on the other side. You got to remember you're going to run over the lines so it's going to bounce a little bit. I find that if I only go halfway each time that it's the distance my hand will work without getting too shaky with it. And it's just that fast. Real soft, real shallow, or just basically just getting rid of the pencil lines so that all you're left with is the diamonds on the fish's body. And we do the smaller ones up here on the face. So since I've already done that on this fish, we'll go ahead and start burning on this one. I have the smaller of the two on, this is a fish scale. It has just a slight curve to it. And always remember that the scales go to the back of the fish. So we gotta make sure our pen is facing in the right direction because I have done this twice now in the wrong way. So we're gonna come in and on the back of the scale of this diamond we're going to lay this pen in in the groove and just walk it up the scales All right. take that off let that cool down and then I'm going to do the larger ones because it's going to be easier for you to see them I did not bring my pole with me so we got a tool These little fish scales uh, tips, the interchangeable tips, are about six to eight bucks a piece. This fish scaling pen, which is a single one size pen, was $36. So if you've got to have four or five different sizes to cover the fish's body, uh, particularly some fish have a, very, a larger degree of variation in the scale patterns on them because they're bigger fish or because of their species. 
So you may need several of these. It's much cheaper to buy the interchangeable tip than it is to buy the whole lot of pens. All right, so we're going to turn our burner up just a bit. And then we're going to come back in here and we're going to do the big ones so it's a little easier for you all to see them. And it really does add a real neat texture to the scales of the body of the fish. And it really keeps you in alignment too as you're working on these. Biggest thing is to keep this at a 90 degree to the body of the fish so you don't have to do too much rocking around on it or you might slide the pen or too, too much of a curve on it. Some of these might be obscured once the pectoral fin goes in here, but that's okay. We want to just leave that all burned in anyway because it's all going to eventually get paint behind there when we get ready to paint the fish. They don't have to be real deep or real hot to be burning these in. It will show up on the paint because we'll use a very thin paint when we do these. So that's why it's important to make sure that the fish's body is sanded well before you put the checkerboard pattern on. And you just keep following the pattern down and just walk it down each side. And if you haven't done the checkerboard with a um, with a little ball on the on the fish before, practice on a piece of scrap. I found that the first time I tried it, I was a little shaky trying to follow the lines. I was almost going too slowly and just really concentrating on the lines. I dug the stone in too far and the grooves were much deeper and I didn't like the end result as much. So again, I sanded it off, started over. That's why it's nice to leave your fish on a little bit on the fat side. So if you make a mistake on the surface, you can take it down, sand it down, and start back over again. And that's always helpful because if you make a mistake on a skinny fish, he's going to only get skinnier. I didn't put one on the fish. I didn't. I suppose I could go back in and put it in later, but I would have to put it in prior to putting in the uh, putting in the diamond pattern. Yes. And as you can see, it really doesn't take much time at all to do this. Once you get the X's on, you can just follow the pattern right down. Oops, that one slid. Okay, we're just about done. Now we'll go back in and do most of these in the body and around the head are very small, fine scales. So we go back to do the finer tip around there and pretty much that's what it's going to look like when it's all finished. Except for this part will be done too. <laughs> um, I really don't have much of a philosophy on it. I mean, if you study the fish's body, you can see where that, where they actually start to transition over. Uh, they, there's only so many pen sizes they have. It's like a small, medium, and large, so you're going to get stuck with what the manufacturer makes, unless you're going to make your own. That's, it, that's pretty much our, what they've got out there. You're kind of limited to what the manufacturer will make on the scale sizes for the pens. Um, I know a lot of guys who are Hardcore to doing fish will make their own pens so that they can have five or six different sizes and do the transition in. I just bought the two because that's pretty much all I need for mine. Um, if we do them according to what I did for here from the tip of the dorsal down to the almost down to the back anal fin back here, um, that transitions from the belly and the bottom of the jaw to, to all the way into the head. And that's all fine scale up in there anyway. So that's just kind of like my dividing line where I think that's where the face is going to go. The rest of it's going to have the larger stuff. And across, across the top is going to be your back. It's going to have your larger scales on it. We just finish these up, and then there's, they're pretty much. I'm going to put the eyes in. Uh, all I got left to do is put the eyes in. I've got the fins already made up, and they're dry fitted into the sockets. 
So then I'm going to have to, um, I drilled these two points to add uh, toothpick pieces in because I broke them off. So I'll just glue them in, recarve them a little bit, shape them up so that they match up really well. And then this one, once the eyes are in, I can be ready to paint. Yeah. Yeah, it gives, uh, it gives um, the, a roundness to the top, a little bit of uh, shape to the scale itself. Um, there's a disease that uh, goldfish get, it's called dropsy, and the fish's scales literally pop off of the body. They get huge, round, domed, and they look like they're popping off. You almost look like a pine cone towards the end of the life. Um, I don't know if there's any cure for the disease, at least when I was keeping goldfish, there wasn't. Once they get it, they'll eventually just go, and they just look like a pine cone towards the end, and they'll die. Um, but this bumping texture gives a, a beautiful look to it, especially once it's painted. Um, these books up here have some excellent examples of how he did the scales on here, and showing how he... Um, does the scale patterns on both of these. He shows you how he does all the scale patterns on in these books. So I, I like both the books because they're both showing you how to lay it out. One guy just does it freehand and I was like, mm, I'm, I'm way too meticulous for that. I have to have lines. <laughs> so I had to measure them all out and draw it out. And the first time it was too wide and so I had to erase it off or sand it off and then start over uh, because the lines weren't close enough together to make the scales look correct on the fish. You can feel this on here, and I'm sure once the paint starts to go on, it's really going to make it, they accentuate the paint job much better and make the fish look much more lifelike. I did it by the size of the pen I had. I worked, the, I worked backwards. I figured out what size of scale I was going to use on the fish and then shrunk the fish down to the size I needed him. I have just these two and then this great big one that I have. This is the first scale pen I bought. Um, and I wanted it just to make the shape. I like the little C. And I played around with this. I've made flowers and uh, decorations and decorative edge work on drums and things that I've made just using this, not as a scale, but as a, just as a marker. So I like to use them for varying other projects. Uh, just because it makes a, a interesting shape, it's more fun to play with it. I don't just use it for, for making fish scales. This is bass wood. All the fish are out of bass. It's kind of fuzzy wood, uh, but it's lightweight. It's inexpensive uh, to obtain, and it's great for beginner carvers to work on. A lot of people like working in bass. It's relatively easy to find and get a hold of. This one is, as you can see, has a curve to it. This, this one guy, guy goes the other way. So these, these boys are going to be swimming around and I've got the flat one that's going to go in the middle. And I have a piece of cypress root that they're going to be swimming around for, just for the display piece. Um, for the larger tip, I'm running it on four, and for the small tip, I run it on three. But that's my burner. I, I, you know, I pretty much three and four. If I have to get really hot, I'll put it up to five. But I don't burn much hotter than that. It doesn't have to be real deep um, or heavy because it, it is going to show up through the paint anyway. Because just like with our birds, we want to put the real thin layers of paint on. Now I'll airbrush these just to be practicing with my airbrush. Acrylics, yeah. Well, that, that's that's what we spray we'll spray them with is with the is acrylics. Yeah. There's a nice uh, pattern uh, in here as well that show you how to lay out the patterns because you do the base. You, I've, all the fish I've ever done, we base them in white first, and you spray them all, start them all on white paint, and then from there you start adding the layers of the colors in. And he's got a really nice spray, step-by-step uh, -step spray instructions in here in this particular book on showing you how it lays out and where these colors go according to where it's at on the body. 
So he goes you step by step and tells you, okay, once it's once you've got your base coat on, and you're going to put a little more of the, um, I think it's called ba bass green. It's actually they name the paint colors after f some of the fish that they paint with it. So there's a bass green that they use on here. There's an ochre, a yellow that they add in. Uh, there's there's a list of colors for each one of the fish that you're going to paint. So um, if you don't know how to mix your colors, you can buy them already mixed, ready made, um, or you can just use your regular uh, set of eight standard colors, your black, white, and your primaries, and mix the colors you need to make your fish the colors you need them. So I carved these guys because um, of the original one I got, the ones that were in this book, uh, oh, this book, I carved the fish that was on the cover here. I took the pattern out and carved this. And I found that the tail section is way too long for a bluegill, for all the bluegills I looked at. So what I did was I augmented the head of the fish and the body a little bit and married perch out of them because the tail is the right length. Um, just had to change the size and put a dent in the center of the tail where it's on the perch and make, and because the fins are all carved separate for the, these fish in this book, I went ahead and just made perch fins for them. So it just gives you an I, you know, instead of making, um, I was going to have six fish and now I've got two sets of three. So I'm going to have the challenge of making the, all the fins for all the fish they're already carved and I'm just going to get them ready to insert and then we'll practice painting and once they're all ready to paint because airbrushing is so quick and it dries so fast um, I have the guys know that you there's a they make a stick with a uh, screw in it and you like put them on like a popsicle stick and you can hang on to them and turn them and work on them when you're spraying them so all each one of these will have a stick be a fish on a stick sticks and <laughs> We'll put, spray them, and then I have a box at home that I have drilled holes into, a wooden box, and you just stick the stick in the box, and when the fish is dry, then you can pick it up and paint the next layer on it, put it back in the box, and none of the fish touch. So it's a nice way to be able to do a group of 6 to 12 fish when you're making production stuff and you're making a lot of fish at one time. It's nice to be able to, to paint them all in one series because you, you're constantly cleaning out the, the airbrush and changing colors, it gets to be a lot of work if you're only doing one little fish. When you're doing six fish, it's much, you could load the thing up with paint and just go through and paint everybody and go, okay, I'm done, okay, let's clean it out. That color's done, now we'll move on to the next color. I do, thank you. <laughs> I do talk with my hands, sorry. Uh, um, it, we hope so. I always like competition. It makes me want to do better next time. Um, if I sell it, that money's, money's better than a ribbon any day. <laughs> and the reason I, I like this book, but the problem with it, the fish that he's got in here for this pumpkin seed is a Missouri pumpkin seed. Because in Michigan, they don't get this big. This is huge. We don't get them this big. You know, this is two pounds, easy. Um, we just don't get fish that size up here. So to me, it's, there's no point in making a 12 inch bluegill. I mean, it's just, it's just, so if you take them down and you do them in this size, it's a little easier to work with. Okay, just let me find the spray paint. He's got the spray thing back here. He's got to find the... I'm not that far in the book. I don't know where I'm at. Okay, here we go. Okay. He's got the base coat down where it's just one solid color. And you can see where he's going to do the head color on here across the top of the head and on the main part of the body. Then he's going to do the centralized area of the body for the color here. And then we're going to pick up just on the belly, on the front of the belly. Then we'll come back over. As you can see, you're going to layer the colors on. Each time you're spraying a layer on, you're going to add just a little bit more. And if you think about any time you're spraying, they're actually micro dots of color. 
So it's basically little tiny dots and they don't go solid unless you really hold that air and the paint in one spot and you're not really working to put that much paint on the fish. So the smaller amounts of the paint are going to give you the colors are going to come through as other colors underneath will show through. So you're building up your layers of the color on here. And then you can do in and do your stripes. Now some of the fish have distinctive stripes and they're not solid. Um, I've seen guys take Q-tips and they'll take three or four Q-tips and they'll rubber band them together and they'll literally just dab them in the paint and then check off any excess paint on the side and then touch them down on the fish and keep just turning that lot of Q-tips to get speckles to make those dots coming down. So there's also uh, miniature daubers that you can buy for from the scrapbooking people. Uh, they come in different sizes. They are little miniature daubers. They actually have wool on the ends of them and they come in three different sizes. You can use those. I've used those for spots on trout because they are irregular. Instead of using a paint pen, which is a very structured, very solid round shape to it, we want something that's a little more irregular and asymmetrical. So the wool dauber gives you a little more interesting look to the dots rather than being so perfectly round. So when you go to put dots on your fish, they're not perfect circles every time. And depending on the fish, but usually when they're done with the, with the bands coming down the fish, if they're speckled, you could, why not speckle them in? It's just like the feet on the ducks. Instead of making them all hash marks, if you look at it, it's actually scales that are actually circles on the, on the bone parts. And the web is actually what's meshed. So if it's just the difference between doing a smooth fish and not putting any of the pattern on or putting the pattern on with the, over the top of the scaling. Now I want to be able to come back and we'll take uh, pictures of these when they're finished so we can see the difference in what they look like uh, versus a smooth fish versus one with the pattern carved into it and see what kind of difference it's going to make in the appearance. I've seen several of them done and I really like the look of it. Um, it just, it's a subtle thing because it's very soft and, it, and it's not real raised on the fish, but it gives definition to the side of the fish that you wouldn't see otherwise. So other than that, getting the fish's colors on, getting them right with an airbrush, it's thin enough paint too that if you make a mistake, you can go back over and correct it without too much of a difficulty. And being acrylic, you're going to be able to go back over that fairly quickly because it does dry much faster than any of the oil-based paints. So this is one of the best books I've seen out there on fish carving. Um, it's got the colors in here. He's got all the patterns in here uh, to do your fish. Uh, it's real accurate as far as what you're doing. So uh, that's what I always recommend. Buy different books from different authors. They're going to have some patterns are really good. Some of them aren't. Uh, the only way you're going to know is to really study the animal get photographs of them. If you fish, great. If you don't, check on, the, on Google image search. You can always find pictures of the peop, of fish that people have actually caught that, are li that were semi-alive when they took the pictures. And you get the coloration, the scales, and look at them. Just study them. And if you want, go out and catch one and put it in the freezer. You can always use it as a live example. You don't even have to eat it if you don't want to. But leave it in the freezer. At least you've got the body to count. Yeah, I, I put I would, the finish is finished. F fins are in. And then you start painting. Yep. Yeah, I paint with the fins in because the fins are, um, let's see who we got here. This is A. I have a mark so I know because we got A, B, and C. Because the fins are matched to the fish. And once these go in, nope, these aren't yours. These are C's. See, they stick out from the body quite a ways because he's turning. When the fish is turning that way, he's using that outside thin as a rudder. So we got that one going that way and this one coming in. It's just a little bit closer to the body.
and we put the undulation in them to give them a little more life, just like we do with the tails. The pectoral fins and the tail are pretty much the ones that they move the most when they're traveling through the water. How do you make the transition from the body to the pectoral fins? I carved my pectoral fins as a bow tie. They were carved in a pair like this. I carve them together like this. And then when they're done, because I, I can hang on to one end, and I leave the center thick until the very end. And then I'll take my sanding drum and just sand the center down and take a diamond wheel and just cut them off. And then go back through and just do a little bit of detail on the edge of the end of the fin to so put the lines back in so that when it disappears in there, you're not going to be able to see that it was sanded anymore. So I add those extra lines back in there. Nope. Scrap from the fish. I just ripped the piece, leftover pieces down. I carved them way too thick, but that gives me the option of going as uh, thinner. And it, it may take me longer to carve them, and I have to work at them a little bit more, but that's okay. I like them a little thicker because then I know how much I can keep taking off just a little bit at a time. Um, most of the time I'll do is nothing but diamonds on them. I don't want to hurry on a fin because you have to, you want to keep it thin enough on the edge to make it look like it's paper thin, but you can have a little more meat in here on the, on the fish scale or on the fin, end of the fin, as long as the edge is fairly thin. Um, the problem is that they get delicate when they get, when these guys get in there. So packing them for a show is, you know, something that you've really got to be careful of. If I have to, t if I have a, to break one, um, I'll have to carve a whole new set of fins. And if you are interested in learning about wood carving, please come and join us at the Woodland Wood Carvers. We meet at the WKTV television station the last Tuesday of every month from, May, from August through May. So just for the summer, for the summer we're off, and we're here for the winter, following winter months. And we start at seven o'clock in the evening, with our show and tell about six thirty. So if you want to come meet everybody, be a little early. <laughs>